Today's panel discussion is part of our format Situations. Situations investigates the shift of image technologies, practices and aesthetics in our increasingly networked society. The current cluster Situations Closure presents photographic works by Samra Banerjee, Simon Fujiwara, Nobotic, Ria Store and Albazari that all call out photography as an ideological capitalist and colonialist system, challenging photography as a universal form of expression. Today's panel discussion will revolve around this last aspect through the lenses of different projects that expose and undermine colonialist narratives and visual regimes. Um, before we hop into the, discuss into the discussion, I wanted to uh, refer to the technicalities. So the event will last around an hour. And for those of you in Zoom, your microphones should be muted already. If not, so please go ahead and mute them now. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Um, if you have questions for the Q&A or throughout the event, you can write a message in the public chat or send them to me or my colleague Doris Gusset. The event is being recorded and will be archived, so please do not activate your camera if you do not want to be recorded. So we are very happy that today's event will be moderated by Tato Mogotzi. Tato, hi. Um, Tato is a Johannesburg-based arts practitioner whose practice spans from curatorial, photographic to archival research. After working as a researcher for South African print media houses, Tato collaborated on and co-curated contemporary art projects and exhibitions in varying institutions. So thank you so much, Tato, for moderating this event today. And now I will hand over the word to her. Thank you, Mona. And thank you to all joining us from various parts of the world. Um, to our four panelists, I'm very excited to um, engage in this conversation with you. Um, so just to give a form of context for the discussion, I've prepared a bit of a framing statement, which I will read for the sake of my nerves. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, while 2020 has been described in global popular conversation as the year of racial reckoning, it is worth acknowledging that much of the work that has to do with resisting repressive ideological structures has in fact been going on long before we arrived at this current brave new lexicon. Specifically, within European art centers, a kind of existential crisis is underway, so to speak. The many public platforms, debates, and discursive gestures that have been presented as responses to demands for the dismantling of institutional coloniality all seem to have become quite convoluted in reactionary ways. For me, this points to a kind of Eurocentric anxiety that I'd be interested in exploring briefly here. From my own non-Western purview in South Africa, as a cont continentally based African practitioner who has engaged in part with the European art ecosystem, what I have also found to be quite curious is the extent to which a post-colonial identity construct continues to prevail in the framing of discussions such as these. It seems to be dependent on the reliable perception of a north-south axis and the historical relational and power dynamics thereof. And perhaps it is along this irrefutable geopolitical axis that we can begin to locate the discomfort of redress in the unfinished business that Europe still has with the majority world. We ought to also remember that in many ways, the medium of photography was used as a tool to perpetuate the inequities and erasures that are inherent in what Walter Manolo identifies as the epistemic privilege of the first world. It follows then, that the uses of the visual archive today could perhaps intersect with forms of epistemic disruption and alternative knowledge production. What unwritten positionalities are encountered in photographic practices that pursue archival investigation? To this end, and as proposed in one of the projects we're looking at tonight, I have an affinity to the idea of decol decolonizing the self before looking outward into the world. By that, I mean being aware of the lens through which we pursue the histories and cultures of others as subjects, 
and how the very act of appropriation puts one in danger of employing extractionist methodologies and practice. Decolonizing the self can also be read as an acknowledgement of and accountability for the emotional labor that decolonial investigation demands of us in our respective locatedness. And for those institutions that want to address it, there is the small matter of social reflexivity. Perhaps then the one question that could be put forward today to all participants, and uh, that includes the audience and panelists, is does your mirror work? In all four of the projects that our panelists will present tonight, there are some cues that direct us toward a more generative rather than rhetorical exploration of decolonial cultural production. And before we proceed to uh, opening up the discussion with our panelists, um, we're inviting them to each individually present them, introduce themselves and present the projects that uh, form part of their current practice. Um, first up, I think we're gonna queue up Ria Store. Hi, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm Ria Starr. I'm a um, artist filmmaker, um, and I work primarily in analog film, primarily with 16 millimeter um, film. And I'm interested in the way that using analog might facilitate a kind of uh, production value, which is um, counter to dominant forms of image making. Um, you can go next slide. Um, so this is the work which is in the exhibition at the moment. It's called The Image That Spits the Eye That Accumulates. And um, this is actually a production still which I made um, for the work which looks at the Norfolk coastline in the UK and situates my body um, as a mixed race woman within that coastline. And in order to make some of the images for the work, I um, used an expired, um, expired Kodachrome film. And I was interested in comparing the now obsolete nature of that film with um, a text by uh, Brent Berlin and Paul Kay called Basic Color Terms, um, where they posit that um, color is universally um, present in language in the same way and that the more culturally evolved the language the more terms uh, for color it has and so um, English um, of course ends up and most of the western world ends up at the top of this um, scale of evolved languages and so I took this film which now you can only develop in black and white and um, photographs everything three times with filters and so anything which moves is not its proper color and so that's kind of a large part of my practice thinking about um, the ways in which uh, making images might not measure up the, the ways in which images fail um, next slide and so then I compared that form of image making with my own body and thinking particularly about um, being mixed race and that perhaps the, the language I have um, is not adequate for me to be visible in both cultures in which I've been brought up. And so kind of this coastline is also eroding into the sea. Um, and it's a site where uh, lots of artifacts have been found from early Europeans. So I was thinking about um, a kind of access to the archive and, and my body as um, sort of how it fits in with those histories and how it can be imaged. Next slide, please. And then a lot of my work is around, or has been around carnival um, and this particular work called A Protest, A Celebration, A Mixed Message um, looks at Leeds West Indian Carnival in the UK, the longest running, and it asks who's performing and who's spectating. Um, the fact that there's quite a large um, white spectatorship here and quite a large black performership, although 
I wouldn't hasten to generalize. Um, I was kind of wanting to ask what that means. Um, what does it mean for me to then photograph a carnival? How is carnival imaged there? So that's kind of what I was interrogating in the film. Again, looking at the archive as well and um, images from the 80s and who has power from their kind of positioning within the image. Next slide. And then finally, this is my last work on Carnival. Um, it's called, Here is the Imagination of the Black Radical. And it is, um, this is just one of the images. It's a cyanotype emulsion that's been put over the image. And I'm thinking particularly here about a kind of refusal um, using abstraction as a way to um, show that there's something which can't be communicated. There's something which um, doesn't quite measure up in the images that I'm, that I'm taking. Up next, we have Julia Grosser, yes. Thank you, Julia. Um, thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation um, by um, Photo Museum. Um, I'm uh, Julia Grosse. I'm an art historian and journalist, and I am together with Yvette Mutumba, um, the co-founder and artistic director of Contemporary End, uh, which we always kind of dis describe or define as a dynamic platform, bringing together different layers of uh, activities around contemporary art practice from Africa and the global diaspora in the widest sense. And um, first slide, please. Yes, thanks so much. And um, today, as you know, obviously we can always talk about our practice in a nutshell. Um, I'm gonna, I'd love to um, focus a little bit, you know, on a project we've been doing since 2017. Um, it's called, or the so-called uh, CN Center of Unfinished Business, so a bit like this uh, evening's uh, panel's title. And uh, it's kind of a mobile reading room and a kind of a walk-in bookcase structure which um, offers visitors, um, let's say, a very diverse and sometimes, well, slightly irritating selection of books um, by uh, focusing on the blind spots of colonial power relations, um, which obviously, you know, continue to impact all areas of society, well, society um, until today, you know, from uh, economy to art, to science, to pop culture, et cetera, et cetera. And next slide, please. Um, Having said that, um, you know, while we might focus on traces and legacies of colonialism uh, in the CN Center, uh, we had, let's say, um, never really an interest or we were, were never really interested in um, um, creating a rather academic and therefore inaccessible uh, hand apparat of, you know, the usual suspect titles around uh, colonialism, post-colonialism, decolonialism, colonialism, etc. But instead, uh, we were rather interested in the question of how uh, intensively colonial legacies still kind of bleed in all kind of, you know, different parts of the today's society. And um, in a way that thought opened, uh, let's say, a whole new world of possibilities for us, as obviously, you know, everything is impacted by colonial traces, um, Wall Street, expressionist art, um, fashion, hip hop culture, you know, even the good old um, Gombrich book, History of Art, as you can see it here in the, in the, in the image, um, you know, even that book, I had it as a, you know, young um, history of art student. And, you know, even that book has its place in our center. And many people ask, you know, why is a book like Gombrich in, uh, Gombrich in your um, collection? And, you know, the question or the answer is because it shows the important blanks and blind spots by claiming to show the complete, you know, history of art, but obviously leaving out most of the many art histories outside Euro Europe and North America. 
you know, the, exactly these blanks um, do interest us. And that's why, you know, books like the Gombrich uh, find their way into our collection next to, you know, books such as, um, uh, you know, biography about the rapper Queen Atipa, for example. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, it's important to us that um, it's always an encounter between us and the institution, uh, which means that we bring our books and um, they, um, the museums, um, need to open their library to us as well so that we can, you know, get out books from their collection, which become part of the ex exhibited center. And, um, you know, as a kind of critical, playful dialogue, because, you know, that can create very interesting and uh, telling moments. Um, for example, when we go into a book, uh, you know, a collection of a museum and suddenly we find 90% um, books focusing on early 2000 network culture written by old white Dutch men, for example. You know, we have these encounters and um, these books obviously, you know, end up in the center and um, create this kind of irritation maybe. And um, it reflects in a way, um, you know, these blanks or special inclusive or exclusive interests, um, which obviously we're not shy to show. Um, next slide, please. Um, and through this, let's say openness when it comes to the selection of books uh, we have in the center, um, it is a very accessible and um, absolute, absolutely non-didactic um, reading room. And that's important to us because we don't want to teach anything to anyone here and uh, rather quote unquote, educate through irritation, um, you know, why this book is next to this one, et cetera. And um, we as well um, don't have a um, handout by a bibliography um, of the titles because we don't call this place a library, um, but rather a reading room. And, um, you know, we don't sum up books like A for Africa in one corner, etc., but more, you know, um, curate these different titles in order to create um, irritation and by creating irritation, opening up, you know, just um, ideas for people why colonial traces or traces of colonial oppression still impact, you know, almost all parts of society, etc. And uh, as mentioned, we created the center as a fully participative, hands-on reading room um, in which you know, grassroots uh, initiatives can meet, um, students can work, we have a you know, printer there as well, visitors can read, etc. And we always invite people to comment and offer uh, them post-its and pens to, you know, to comment and leave their feedback uh, on the library. As you can see on this picture, this is uh, in Cologne at the um, Museum Ludwig where uh, the center had uh, its exhibition this uh, summer. And um, which you can see here, you know, the visitors um, completely went wild uh, commenting um, in all, you know, different kinds of um, thoughts and reflections, some of them very emotional because, you know, Germany has just opened the museums again uh, at that time, it was in June. And you can literally, you could literally feel, you know, the people's hunger to come and to speak out everything about COVID, about the eruptions um, through the murder of George Floyd, which just happened, you know, two weeks prior to that picture taken, etc. And we love these posters because, you know, they are in a way a fantastic and very simple tool, um, you know, to, to make a voice or a trace um, of the visitors heard and, and seen. Uh, in the next, 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 last slide. Um, as mentioned, the center is a moving um, reading room and can evolve in different shapes and forms and formats. This is um, a small version, we call it residency um, at the Art Space School in Vienna. And uh, in terms of participation, what we uh, often do, not often, but sometimes do um, in these different iterations of the center is um, doing this kind of reading exercises. Um, and the idea is to, to do a big read out loud coming together, as you can see here on the picture in a very associative way. So everybody has 10 minutes to take or pick a book out of the center and read a short passage of it, followed by the next person who maybe feels that her passage um, or her book works nicely or maybe is irritating, uh, which can create a nice flow as well. And uh, we did this the first time together with a 
team of the documenter, the last documenter uh, in our first um, center. And um, it's a, the beautiful thing about this session um, is that um, it, it's, it creates this kind of new narration and alternative narration, um, which can only be told in a group together and not by one single voice, but by many voices who tell not one story, but, but many. So it's a very beautiful um, image, um, we think, which can happen in the center. Maybe, so that's just in a nutshell. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, Mona. Thank you, Photomuseum. Thank you, Tato, for this invitation. And well, I'm Gloria Yerzaba. I'm a Spanish artist, and I've been working around um, um, colonization and how the idea of Africa was built in a very Machiavellian way. And um, how the um, colonization of the mind affected not only geopolitical, but in a very various ways. So next slide, please. Um, I'm here uh, invited because of my book. Well, it comes from a personal experience. When I was living in Mali, uh, I had this reaction uh, which years later it was kind of uh, so embarrassment for me and I thought that I had to go through a path of trying to understand why I had to to decenter my discourse and and well maybe decolonize myself which is a word that is very much in vogue and I wouldn't like to overuse it. What I discovered through a, a historical research was uh, how the camera was used um, as one of these coloniz colonization tools together with the Bible and the weapons. And I use it as um, how anthropological uh, approach to, to the discovering of the, the other was really uh, something that helped uh, Europe to, to reinforce their uh, vision of being su superior. So the, the other was used to, to maybe um, confirm what we were not uh, in a very supremacist way. So that otherness was um, uh, uh, studied in a, in a very keen way to, 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 to just uh, reinforce our own identity, you know? Next slide, please. So I'm talking about um, white privilege, about stereotypes, about um, beauty canons, uh, how those stereotypes usually put the African woman in a, in a very hyperbolized way, how these women usually is victimized or um, hyper-sexualized or uh, put in a very primitive way. Um, so I made up, I mixed archives, images that I found during an artist residence in Lagos. And those studio photos um, I shot there, uh, I did it as a way of um, making this very, very exaggerated uh, um, studio photos. Next slide, please. So mainly what I was, uh, I was trying to understand was what was the position of uh, today's woman in this very, very wide um, spectrum of my, my experience in, in, in that ambience. So I play a little bit with, with the sound of images, as you can see here, you can nearly hear it. 
and um, I also wanted to 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 make clear that I'm not talking about African feminism. I'm talking more about how colonization affected the concept of women through beauty canons, through the colonization of the mind, through language, through concepts of modernity, through um, a religion, through Victorian education, through uh, uh, mono, monotheistic religions, uh, which uh, previously had nothing to do. So uh, I started reading all these books about um, um, written by uh, African uh, feminist writers as uh, the mention of women by Oyeronki Oyewemis, uh, which mainly she says that um, before colonization, uh, women's privilege I mean, privilege wasn't linked to, to gender, but to age or to lineage. So next slide, please. Just to conclude that uh, for me, uh, we can't universalize this uh, mainstream uh, feminist uh, discourses as uh, women experience is um, it has to do a lot with the, our health, our gender, our race, our um, religion, passport, uh, many things that we all have to put in the same level in order to compare. Um, I think that's the last one. Cool, thank you, Gloria. Lorena. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, my name is Lorena Rizzo. I'm a historian by training. Uh, I'm based at the University of Basel in Switzerland and I work in Namibia and South Africa. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in view of this conversation tonight, I revisited my work in the past 10 years and picked this particular project because I felt it might speak to some of the issues we want to address here tonight. Um, it's, it was called originally Usakov's Photographs Beyond Ruins. Um, it's a, an exhibition project and a public history project of some sort. Um, the image you see here is the cover of the exhibition catalog we produced in 2015. And you can see the names of uh, the original group involved in this project in the, in the beginning, uh, the late Paul Grandin, a Cape Town based photographer, Giorgio Miescher, a colleague of mine at the University of Basel, myself and Tina Smith, an artist and curator at the District 6 Museum in Cape Town. And this project was, uh, oh, let's say the exhibition and the book feature um, private photographic collections from Usakos, a central, a town in central Namibia. And they addressed, um, issues around forced removals in the late 1950s and early 1960s of a particular African neighborhood in, in this particular Namibian town. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the main um, actors in, in, in the Usakos project, which who are the women um, who collected uh, the photographs we included in the exhibition and the catalog. And they are Gisela Peters, Olga Garoes, Wilhelmine Kachimun, and Cecilia Geistes. Uh, in the photograph, you see Gisela Peters and Olga Garoes. And except for G Gisela Peters, all of these women passed away. In the meantime, the photograph was taken by Paul Grendon uh, in Olga Garos, Garos' house in 2015. Um, what we were interested in in this project was to understand what it is these uh, four women did or do 
uh, with uh, photographs and how they used photography as a as an aesthetic and cultural um, practice in the context of both historical narration and, and memory work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these two images were taken on the occasion of the opening of, an ex of the exhibition and a local museum in Usakos in 2015. Um, and I would like to use this slide to raise uh, four, very briefly, four points which uh, seem important to me in this project. Uh, the first one being that it, it was a collaborative one. So it included um, students, academics, artists, and and community members in Namibia, South Africa, and Switzerland. And we worked together in, in a framework in which we were all committed, first and for, foremost, to building uh, a local or institutions at the local level, precisely in the town we were working in. And that's why we uh, went for an exhibition and we helped launch a local museum and um, the term is charged in, in certain ways uh, and the institution is and we can maybe um, talk about that later on in terms of what it means, what kind of place uh, this museum uh, might describe. Uh, the third point for me uh, was a question of time. Um, and how much time as an academic, how much time you want to uh, commit uh, to a project. Uh, my colleague Giorgio Misch and I began this project in 2012 and it's still ongoing up to today. Currently, we're trying to make sure that the museum survives and that people who are involved in working in and around the museum can actually make a living. Um, and the last point I would like to mention is, relates to the ways in which I think we try to handle the photographs from these collections in the project. And one thing we cared about in our conversations with the four women was that we made sure that every individual in the photographs uh, would be identified by name. And all of us, um, I think we did so because we felt increasingly inc uncomfortable about reproducing, displaying and circulating photographs of anonymous um, African men and women. And we didn't want to insert the collections in let's say, a uh, discourse on cultural or et even ethnic identity or um, a, a history of photography in Namibia. What we wanted to do is to keep the photographs within the frameworks of life histories and, and memory work, which were the frameworks the women themselves chose uh, for their material. And I think the fact that everyone is named uh, in the photographs also tells you something about the kind of audiences you have in mind with a project uh, like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I think we'll uh, keep the same order um, in the discussion. I'm going to uh, put forward a, a question for each panelist to respond to, and then um, uh, we'll later get into audience questions into a QA. and a um, Raya, uh, I, let me, okay. So when I spoke earlier about my interest in complicating the post-colonial identity construct, um, and how it seems to proliferate as a kind of shorthand for the contemporary conditions of black uh, blackness and black 
diasporic, um, the black diasporic context within Europe. Um, I was thinking through that um, based on the kinds of um, very heightened moments of discussion around racial representation and identity politics that we saw um, in this year uh, in occurring in uh, the United States, but also in, in Britain. Um, so in terms of your film, the image that spits, the eye that accumulates, um, I'm especially intrigued by the question of the duality of your mixed race identity, if I can call it that. Um, can you speak perhaps about the way in which the materiality of photography and, and film allows you to deconstruct um, notions of what is a visible and invisible body um, or identity? I don't know if that 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 is something you can speak to, and maybe in also in relation to the other film you spoke about, a protest, a celebration, a mixed message, because I think the idea of who's constructing uh, the image, who's looking, who is performing, uh, how photography can render bodies as both hyper-visible and, and um, invisible at the same time. Yeah, I was, um, in both of those films, I'm talking about being uh, mixed race, really, and, or biracial, if you're in the US. And, um, <laughs> I guess that um, as an artist, what interests me is that if you can image this idea of blackness or what blackness is um, well in a way that's readable, then that's something which people can understand and 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 see and get get something from, but. The way in which I wanted to speak is a way in which it's perhaps not so readable. Um, and the conclusion that I came to, especially in a protest, a celebration, a mixed message, is that really I'm I'm not hesitant about the fact that what I'm saying might not be as readable as a um, more well-known or stereotyped version of blackness but that's okay and that um whilst my body specifically might not be readable i'm going to be very certain about um that uncertainty so i'm always um making images or um treating images that i found in a way which um, makes a definite statement and then will undo that statement so particularly in the image that spits, the eye that mm. accumulates, there's so many different formats. Um, yes, I'm using like expired film, but then there's also um, some family photographs. There are also some digital photographs. Some things I um, refilm often and rescreen. So, what I want to do is not, is to ask questions rather than kind of answer anything. And that's the way that I found is um, sort of most interesting to me to navigate this kind of ground of identity, which really is clear for, mm. for no one. Um, it's just on, on my particular body and other people who are mixed race, it's, it, it can't be anything but unclear. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we're in a moment now as well. I mentioned a brave new lexicon in my statement earlier because I, I think of what's happening now with the current vocabulary around identity and, and racial uh, representation to be quite, um, we're falling into a kind of trap where there are certain terms and phrases and, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, uh, hashtags, if you will, that um, uh, oversimplify um, what we mean when we talk about uh, Black visibility and a complication of um, various constructs of, of Blackness. 
Um, so yeah, I really appreciated your work in that sense. And I think it fits very well in the exhibition, the closure uh, that formed part of situations. Um, I, I, I really liked your use of the, over, uh, the overlay text um, in the first few frames of the film, the image that spits, where you ask uh, rhetorically, you ask the viewer, what are you expecting to hear here? A black voice, a white voice, and then you provide an answer, um, as kind of uh, uh, answer. Well, praise be, this body is both and neither. Like the photograph, the other bodies just weren't good enough. And I quite think that's such an exciting um, uh, uh, way to play with, with this idea of um, uh, readability. Um, and yeah, what, what, what you present in, in the images that you, again, also sort of overlay um, several times um, in your process. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> it's not as if um, I'm against like talking about a black a black aesthetic. I'm very interested mm. in um, the ways that that's been theorized, but maybe as a kind of political device um, mm. rather than speaking truth at, on a, a kind of authoritarian. This is what it mm. means to be black and to make work. I'm interested mm. in what those. Um, you know, like Sun Ra and uh, Amiri Barak and all of those um, slightly enigmatic works, what it means to um, propose that as if it is fact, as if, mm -hmm. as if it is fact, as, um, mm -hmm. yeah, as an imaginative device. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned refusal um, when you were talking to the film, and that's also part of a, a, a growing um, discourse that's gaining currency from scholars like uh, Tina Kemp, Saidiya Hartman, and Arthur Jaffa, who also employs film. Uh, actually, your work did, I must say, it reminded me of, of Arthur Jaffa to a certain degree. Um, and so I, when you when you mentioned refusal, I was quite excited about um, the fact that you are thinking in dialogue with with that kind of conceptualization. Yeah, I'm interested in Arthur Jaffa's work specifically in the way that he talks about black visual intonation that mm. um, that film can do something that jazz did for black mm. musicians. Um, but I think for me, it has to be more specific to place. And I, that's something I talk about too in my work, being brought up mm. in a very rural environment um, and where that kind of specificity and avoidance of stereotype can happen is by relating it back kind of to my own experience and um, having this like Caribbean influence in Britain, mm. which itself has a really complicated relationship with the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rhea. And I suppose, um, Julia, um, the Contemporary and uh, Center for Unfinished Business sort of allowed us to um, <laughs> co-opt part of the title of your project um, for this discussion because I think for me, the idea of uh, um, the notion of unfinished business, the unfinished business that Europe has with its former colonies mm -hmm. comes to mind immediately. Uh, again, I'm gonna bring it to current um, uh, discourses. Um, and for me, that unfinished business immediately triggers the conversation around restitution. If we look at the contestation that has arisen around uh, the restitution of African um, archives, uh, material culture, well, for me, I, I, that's how I arrived at this idea of a Eurocentric anxiety. Mm. Um, and I'm interested in the challenge that your project has put forward for the critical reassessment of dominant narratives, right? Mm -hmm. That relate to the impact of colonialism mm -hmm. um, and the conditions of post-coloniality. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the ways in which the project has had to address this discomfort that may have arisen from 
say a German or a wider European audience. Um, mm -hmm. Because anxiety comes from mm. the um, comes with the acknowledgement of the blind spots that you speak of mm. uh, in a in a difficult history and um, and a realization that there are fallacies and failures to hegemonic and dominant knowledge systems that have informed a singular worldview, right? Mm. So. Have, have there been moments where you've had to, I mean, you, ha you have mentioned earlier that, you know, you, the project is not, is not setting out to educate, mm -hmm. but, you know, I would imagine that you would ha have had to somehow uh, give your own sort of form of positionality on the discomfort that you may have encountered from audiences that engaged with this challenge that your mm -hmm. project is putting forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Uh, what I um, first of all wanted to refer to um, the detail you said um, uh, before, which I find very interesting and important as well, and um, the use of or the the usage of you know specific words, uh, which um, um, especially you know in our context, a European German context, uh, institutions uh, right now taking on in order to globalize, deliberate themselves, uh, decolonize yeah. them, their archives, their cafeteria, everything, you know, needs to be decolonized. That's why <laughs> um, from our perspective, um, as the end, um, we're quite, um, 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 we try to work, to use these words in a quite mm -hmm. um, small dosage, let's say, um, mm -hmm. because for example, um, because, for example, in a German context, we don't even sometimes see that institutions, for example, have understood the concept of the decolonized practice, because mm -hmm. obviously it doesn't come from a European perspective, the, the word and idea yeah. itself, but from, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned Walter Mignolo. So mm -hmm. this is why um, we always try to avoid even, you know, mentioning these, these words. And that's why, um, for example, in the center, as you said, we came up with this idea describing the fact that everything is still impacted through, um, you know, colonial, um, colonial oppression in a way, but without naming it in a title, but still, mm -hmm. hopefully through, as I said, education through irritation, um, getting people to kind of understand, um, understand the mm -hmm. impact of colonial legacies and traces by um, you know, bringing in as many books from a broader scale as possible by not saying, mm -hmm. okay, this is what you need to know about colonialism, post-colonialism, decolonialism, go mm -hmm. through it and you come out, you know, um, uh, deliberated or educated, yeah? And that's <laughs> why we thought um, it's so much, um, from our perspective, um, it's so much hopefully more powerful to um, to confront people with a book on expressionism where where most of people think well, you know the nice expressionists the blauer writer you know what what do they have to do with exp you know with colonial legacies and traces and obviously you know the mm -hmm. inspiration by for example the expressionists ca came you know from um, very ex ex exoticized images of the other mm -hmm. yeah etc mm -hmm. and um, this obviously just slowly starts to get, um, um, you know, kind of put on the t on, on on the plate or on the table of the mm -hmm. institutions who, you know, mm -hmm. suddenly look at Nolder and the expressionists in a in a more critical way, which you know would have never been the case like ten years ago. You had an expressionist uh, exhibition, mm -hmm. and everyone you know would be happy. It's, you know, no one had quest questioned um, the involvement of you know, the avant-garde in, in colonial, you know, um, colonial um, mm -hmm. constructions, let's say. And that's why um, I think for us, especially in a German context, you know, the center is going, it's in France right now, which is sad because, you know, the museums are closed. So, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's in Toulouse, but um, in a German context, it's especially for us uh, uh, an important task to show the center or the reading room there, because as you might know, um, mm -hmm. you know the, the, the topic of German colonialism hasn't mm -hmm. been a topic in German history classes in school some years ago, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. it, it's still, in a way, it's it's an important educative 
task to 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 show German visitors and people as mm. well. Obviously, we had we had colonialism. You know, if we talk yeah. about colonialism, it's not France and UK, blah blah blah. In Portugal, mm. it's us as well. So that's mm. why it was important to us to um to introduce the German uh, audience uh, to this topic, which um, is part of of themselves as well in a um, very accessible way. You know, yeah. uh, and say and and kind of catch them by, you know, delivering as, as broad titles, as inviting uh, titles as, as possible in a way. And mm. I hope that that, uh, mm. that works and kind of opens or triggers something through these um, sometimes irritating, um, but very accessible uh, titles. Yeah, I quite like that irritation, <laughs> <laughs> educate through irritation. And I think it's also yeah. through allowing people to navigate on their own. Um, yes, the yes. books that you have in the reading yes. room. Mm -hmm. um, I was also quite excited to hear that you have these reading sessions, reading out loud mm -hmm. sessions. Mm -hmm. That becomes also a way to um, introduce the idea of a multivocal yes. uh, uh, education or, or multivocal encounter with different uh, knowledges. Yes. Um, so I'm quite interested if. Um, you you and Yvette have ever felt uh, a sense of exhaustion kind of from the emotional right now, labor I'm very exhausted yes of course year. now <laughs> like our, all of us were very exhausted from this crazy year you know what I, I just heard a, an, an interesting um, quote by someone um, like a history professor asking uh, young uh, uh, history students uh, what part of 2020 do you want to, you know, focus your PhD on? Because normally, mm. what, what part of the last decade or what part of the 20th century, you know? But this year <laughs> has been so dense that you ask, what part of 2020 is is your thing? Is it the eruptions through Black Lives exactly. Matter? Or is it, is exactly. It and that's that's why I'm. I think we're all exhausted, but sorry. Yeah. What did you yeah. want to ask? No, wait, yes. no, I mean, you've, you've responded to, to the very thing I, I, mm. I was trying to frame mm. again in my statement about the emotional labor that comes with, with mm. decolonial investigation and practice. So, yeah, mm. I think the project absolutely would elicit a kind of uh, a, a weight, um, but, you know, everyone should take on the responsibility of emotional labor yeah. when engaging with projects like this so I really appreciate the yeah. work that, and as you that saw you know as I, as I said you know these this the, the structure literally covered mm -hmm. with the faucets for us short because we had never had this in this intense intensity yeah? and it mm -hmm. was literally three weeks after the murder of uh, George Floyd and it really reflected Jeez. this hunger or you know this 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 need of people uh, to just to just comment or to leave a mark uh, about mm. what they thought of this whole crazy situation they we, we're all in right and mm. this 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 was this, this was this kind of visible outburst of of, um, of voices mm. of people and this that this uh, you know it's such a simple tool but we're very happy that it kind of works out and people you know take it and work with it yeah it's super effective thank you julia thank you <laughs> gloria here I am. Wonderful. Hi. Um, Hi. So uh, uh, thank you for for thinking. Um, unfortunately, you weren't able to give me the the physical book, but I, the PDF was extensive enough. It was really it still looked visually quite quite interesting. Um, and I think I want to start right at the top with the title that you've employed for the book, uh, Women Go No Agree, which is obviously in uh, West African pidgin English, right? It um, is. But yeah, but I was hoping you could sort of tell me more about uh, the use of that title, because I think it might give us even more of an idea of the ambitious scope of the many challenging um, points of discourse that your book is trying to explore um, through both the visual language that you, you employ and your kind of your use of these found archives um, that you uncovered in West Africa. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it actually, it's not women go no gree, it's women uh, no go gree, but- oh, right. Uh, no, 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 no. It's, it's. I mean, you said it okay, but the, the, the truth. The, I mean, 
it's a it's a it's a phrase you find in in Felakuti's song Lady, mm -hmm. which comes out. But it's me who like did like a turn it uh, upside down. Just it's just like saying I mean even I'm I'm a white I'm I'm so white that I even said it say it wrong. No, I mean <laughs> just <laughs> it was a play of words and so. Um, in 1972, in Nigeria, uh, Felakuti was much more than just the Afrobeat uh, creator, or musician. He was uh, really an activist, politician activist, and his mother was the great, great feminist. Uh, I mean, she was a really mm -hmm. a symbol. And um, this year, uh, which was like very important for Nigerian economy and where at this point, uh, I mean, the Biafra war was finished and they had like 10 years of independence. And so in this, in this song, it, it was quite controversial because he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't, like, he's not like, uh, Pro uh, liberation of women or anti. I mean, he's it's very ambiguous. So, um, like two years ago, the song was um, taken uh, by uh, An Anjali Kijo and, and another musicians as a as a symbol of of uh, African women empowerment. But the truth is that at that point, it was it was quite. Um, mixed feelings because it says mm. okay women don't you don't have to go agree with uh, everything your man says but at the same time it, it says um you don't have to follow like western um, um, models of empowerment mm. so it mm. was like, perfect okay great great and okay so then then the secondary question I'd put forward to you, Gloria, has to do with this idea of where you position yourself in the project um, as, as you said, a European white woman um, and your attempt at decentering white feminism. Uh, and I'm trying to understand in particular the kind of tension you've created in the book, particularly by juxtaposing the images um, within these very violent ethnographic uh, colonial archives that you encountered um, alongside your own studio portraiture. Am I right? Is that the, 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 the thing that's happening in the book in terms of the layout? Um, and I'm trying to understand what you were trying to do with that tension. Um, there's a kind of, um, it, it, there's a, I'm, I'm tempted to reject the juxtaposition, but perhaps if I understand what you were trying to do um, as someone who, you know, I suppose immersed yourself in a particular community in Mali when you were living there and in Nigeria when you were working there, um, your relationship to these archives and how you situate your studio or your own photography alongside them is something I'd, I'd like to perhaps find out more about from you. Okay, so in the book, not uh, in, in each page, you find mm. those two, uh, I mean, those two just juxtapositions. I mean, it's usually, it's um, more, I mean, the studio photos are alone and the archives, there are two mm -hmm. kinds of archives, the ones that I don't, um, um, Put my hand on and the other ones that I put these like dreamy uh, fil color filters um, I don't I don't know I mean I it's something like very very intimate that comes out from my experience of uh, may maybe I mean I like all the I mean Julia talked about so many interesting things about I mean that that irritation concept you no know? I was mm -hmm. irritated. I mean, in the on, on my book, you can see indignation. Indignation is the, the first word you you see here. You know, indignation. Mm -hmm. I was indignated. So, 
I mean, I don't know if I wanted to irritate putting these two things, these two, but not, of course, not the African women public. I, I wanted maybe to irritate my white colleagues to just make them react. But as Ria said, uh, I also pose questions. I don't give so many answers. I was, this is a, a very a personal um, path that I took and I just needed to do it to understand what, why I was, my, my first reaction was like, I mean, I don't understand why this, this matriarchal um, social structures have, uh, are living like that. And why don't they look at us as we um, achieved so many things. So it was so, I was so ashamed when I realized <laughs> Why I said that. So I just had to really go through all my self mm, discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe putting all those images that maybe are very strionic or maybe mm -hmm. they're very like they they clash and they they they're not mm -hmm. uh, nicely displayed for your your I mean if you I mean, I, at the end, there's there's a one sentence that I I like. It's some, I mean, it's a Franz Fanon um, quote that I put that at the end of the of the images because I mean, it's it for me it was like okay, I I can finish with this. He says, "Why write this book? No one has has asked me for it, especially those to whom it is directed." So, you know. Mm. Mm. I don't want to irritate. I want to to maybe think that there's there's another possibility of of mm. relating bodies, identities, and mm. Mm. I can imagine that the responses you received um, about the book have have been quite diverse. So, um, but thank you and congratulations on the the photo book award. Thank you, um, Lorena. I am very familiar with the Osakos I project, know. by the way. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, um, I was working with an independent project space in Johannesburg that hosted your exhibition when you brought it to Johannesburg. So, yeah. yeah. I, I have not come the then, so uh, yeah. unfortunately, but Paul, George, and Tina were there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I suppose because um, of um, the time that has passed since you began the project, executed the book and had the exhibition, um, I'd like to spend a bit of time uh, talking through the idea for the museum in Osakos and how that sort of is an exercise perhaps in um, retaining or maintaining the relationship that the community, the source community, so to speak, um, still has uh, to the pho photographic collections um, that these four women sort of uh, functioned as custodians of, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, how is how is the museum looking? How has the idea shifted? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, frankly, I can't really answer your question uh, for mm -hmm. for several reasons. Um, so. One is that while in the beginning of the project, um, Paul, Georgia, Tina, and I were the kind of, I guess, main figures that drove certain dynamics, uh, that's changed. And it's been taken over much more by uh, Namibian colleagues and institutions and the community itself. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it's a precarious project. Um, so the original um, exhibition was in the municipality building. In, so this mm. is a very small rural town in central Namibia comparable to any other rural small mm. town across South Africa. Mm. Um, and the museum, we, we got a room in the municipality building to open the exhibition in 2015. At that point, um, there was this idea that this might be the launch of a local museum. So it's not, you know, it's unfinished in the sense that mm. it's a very complicated, very long process. 
Mm. Um, uh, then yeah. there were initiatives around, you know, um, people's response to the exhibition, of course, was very positive. Um, mm. I mean, you know, there are always kind of ambiguities, uh, but the general response from uh, the local or the town's uh, communities was positive in terms of, you know, valuing parts of histories that had remained un. un uh, submerged in a kind of um, settler society driven historical narrative of these places mm -hmm. and people did begin to bring objects uh, not only images but mm -hmm. things they felt had to go <laughs> into a, mm -hmm. a, a community museum um, mm -hmm. but at some point um, you know, the main uh, energies went into formalizing a certain kind of institutional process, uh, recognizing the place as a museum, inserting it into the kind of museum structure um, in Namibia, which is mainly a work done by the Museums Association. Mm. Um, so that took years. I mean, it sounds banal, but it's it's a very complicated mm. process if you don't have the funds and the resources to do it. And finally, yeah. just mm. to, sorry. No, the, continue, go just, ahead, yeah. So the municipality never left the building. That was oh. a different, another issue, right? So the mm. municipality stayed in the building for much longer than we had anticipated, which changed last year. So they moved into a new building and now the museum, the building, right, mm. uh, would be available. Uh, but as you know, things uh, have slowed down massively mm. just now. Mm. I, th I, I also don't want to answer it because I feel it's something probably people need to sort out for themselves what it is um, they want to do in that space. It's a beautiful building. It's a historical um, German colonial building. Uh, it's been renovated partly, um, mm. but you know, kind of figuring out for themselves what a museum or gallery space might mean for them mm. and how they mm. would want to use it. That's that's ongoing, and it's nothing I'm directly involved in anymore. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. And I think I asked because of, I suppose, what I was trying to bring to the table is how, um, you know, there are also um, institutional um, constructs that I think I think we um, tend to forget have an, a colonial origin within the African context or where it, outside of the non-Western, outside of the European or Western context that also need to be dismantled. Those ideas that, of what a museum is still hold on to colonial imagination. Um, and there are other ways to think about uh, how we, um, how we mm, navigate and yeah, navigate that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I personally believe that the expertise concerning these shifts uh, at, you know, in these institutions is in Namibia mm. and it's not in, in Basel. And that's why mm. we kind of stepped back. Um, yeah. They yeah. just know better than we do. Yeah. And I also understand that your projects um, with the um, aesthetics from the margins is um, actually the real question I wanted to ask you, Lorena, I'm sorry, yeah. forgive me. No, no, no. Is, is the use of the term um, the marginal in the name for your um, research organization at the Center for African Studies. I'm, yeah. I'm curious as to how you uh, situate it um, in the work that you do there. Um, because it brings me back to my earlier point again about the north-south axis and this kind of yeah. uh, stubborn preoccupation that I think um, Europe tends to have with this uh, relational uh, geopolitical dynamic, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, how is um, the marginal, uh, marginalized, um, situated in in 
your organization in terms yeah. of the way you work? Mm. Um, I mean, I can only speak for myself with several people involved in, I mean, there's mm. someone like Kadyatu Diallo who does different yeah. kind of work. Um, so mm. her answer would, would be a different one. I mean, you know, it's a kind of good title in the sense that it's so vague and it can mean so many things that people sure. somehow can connect with it easily. For myself, it's actually not necessarily about the kind of European African acts Access in the beginning, it was to kind of um, negotiate the relationship, understand the relationship between Libya and South Africa. Okay. Um, and in that particular history, which is a regional history, not exclusively, but um, yeah, in some ways, is a region. So that's a different axis. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, you know, the sense that if you and I'm originally uh, work, I worked in Namibia for much longer than I did in South Africa. And if you work in Namibia, you inevitably always have to speak to South African conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And your reference point is South African academic institutions, mm -hmm. um, cultural institutions, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of sense of there's no escaping mm. of that kind of center right for Namibian conversations which is not the case the other way around right most mm. South Africans hardly know <laughs> yeah. where Namibia is and you know how it's kind yeah. of entangled yeah. so I think that was my original sense of you know that we've been working from Okay. that kind of margin that speaks okay. to the center which is not a european one okay um, so yeah, that's that... where, where it came mm -hmm. from but you know to me it's i mean the geo it's charged in a certain way mm -hmm. um, obviously i mean geopolitics historically within the kind of imperial formations mm -hmm. but it's also positionality in terms of cri criticism and critique you know a mm -hmm. position you want to inhabit Mm. Uh, in certain ways uh, in order to think of, I mean, if you call it thinking on the limit or, I mean, there are different terms that describe that. I mm. think for, for me, it's really about Namibia as a, uh, as a real and as a kind of discursive space in a particular formation, which for me is mainly about South Africa. Okay. I great. don't work on the German colonial period, so maybe that's also why. Um... No, it's okay. I'm fully aware of the problematic exceptionalism of South Africanness. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not an attack. I mean, it's specified. No, no, I, I agree, I mean, and I think, um, yeah, no, no, that that offers a lot. That offers a lot of clarity. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Lorena. You must. I think. Welcome. Thank you. I think we're going to have to move on to the Q&A quickly. Um, I hope we're getting some questions. Mona, could you um, give us a sense of any interest? I mean, again, I brought up, I, the, I hope the questions that I've put forward to the panelists have sort of um, brought forth a kind of, um, a thread of thinking around, um, you know, challenging the universalization of uh, practices of cultural and knowledge production um, in the work that we do, um, particularly from the kind of locatedness that we all have respectively. Um, and I think uh, what, what the, you know, what Photo Museum Vintata is doing with the Forum for Situations, I think is a, is an, is a good introduction to, to this kind of um, uh, questioning, pro process of questioning, process of reminding ourselves of, of our respective perspectives. Um, so far, there are no questions, but I have one myself. Um, okay, it's more um, regarded to Ria's work. Um, mm. Because, I mean, Ria is part of the show and um, also one of the reasons why she was, why I was like very intrigued by her work is how, and the way she reflects the uh, racist um, infringements of color film. Maybe Ria, you can also mm. talk a little bit about that. 
because I mean that's also something like for situations which has been a big part is how like the um already the technological part of photography and even like the color films for example are inscribed with these prejudices mm. yeah and I think for me um using Kodachrome in particular was interesting because it had been hailed as um like the best film for making an archive mm. um but that's it wasn't that's not particular really to skin color which i think is more what you're alluding to um in other work i've been interested in the um women who appear on the front of films they're called they were called um china girls and often they would be very light-skinned women and eventually they were replaced by mannequins um but they were used so that the film could be graded um properly they were kind of like the benchmark so um the idea of this universal standard um or whatever is already implied in the way that film uh, renders skin tones, for instance, and that still um, that still persists. So in this particular film, I um, it's called Junk and You Talk. I just took um, a, a subliminal um, piece of film of a um, a black woman in costume and. To me, she functioned as kind of like the um, a resistance to those China girls in film. So I think there's ways in which that particular um, there's ways in which color can be subverted, or the idea of color as a universal standard might be um, subverted by embracing those parts of um, filmmaking which. Um, show the the inequality that's inherent already to the the technologies of the medium. Yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, well, I can just like tell the audience you can like post your questions if you have any. Otherwise, I'm just gonna move on and ask another question can myself. I, can I? Ask oh, there's something? one. Yes. Oh, one yes. Question. Sure. Sure. Oh, here's a question uh, from Carolina. Uh, for Gloria in particular, um, as a Spanish woman, why did you choose to study the African continent where Spain had a small participation compared to other European countries? Have you also studied the colonies of Spain, the women in Latin America, for example? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, yes, I mean, it, I, I, when I was like 14 years old, I discovered that, I mean, I, I didn't live in, in, in Spain all my life. I lived in, 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 in Ecuador. And when I came back, I realized that suddenly I saw a black man, like very well dressed on, on the bus, uh, with his suitcase, a very elegant man and speaking in Spanish. So I, when I got home, I asked my father and, and I didn't have a clue that we had a African colony uh, where they spoke Spanish and where they, they had like names like Fernando and Garcia. And so for me, it was my first shock. And then, I mean, I was just traveling around when, in my twenties around uh, Africa, but mainly I think that I don't position myself as a Spanish woman talking about Africa. I'm just uh, um, an artist of whatever. I, I mean, I don't mind imper imperialism, colonization is all around. And um, for me, I mean, my previous work uh, was about how Franco, uh, uh, I, maybe indirectly, uh, was in inside the, the Congo's um, 
the Democratic Republic of Congo's uh, independence process and, and all that. So, I mean, there's something that always led me to, to, to find our own responsibilities. I mean, my next project that's going to be about restitution that you talked about previously, uh, actually with all these restrictions, I'm not, I, mean, I have a grant and I'm not being able to, to, to travel to all these museums in Europe. So maybe, I mean, if this doesn't get better, I will have to do it with our own uh, colonial heritage. And that would be a plan B that maybe it's even better for me, but who knows? So um, yes, women in Latin America, probably, I mean, uh, when I'm talking about um, the colonization of the concept of women, it, it's so linked to imperialism um, um, ideology that it can it can be applied to any kind of colonization around the planet. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. I mean, that question of I mean, it's something that formed part of the uh, announcement for this panel discussion. Um, the question about who has an authority to document, to write, to speak to about um, uh, other cultures and other places um, and the kind of implication that comes with, with choosing to work outside of your immediate identity, I suppose. Um, it, it, it's a, for me as a South African here, in terms of photography, it definitely, it, it's an undying uh, uh, <laughs> question. It does not have a closure itself. And, you know, we all have our own opinions on it and it's quite heated, uh, but, you know, where there is a reperpetuation of trauma or violence in the work that you are doing in other people's lives and communities and cultures, then there's an immediate recognition of a, of a, of a um, ethical, uh, um, breach, right? Uh, and you're breaching an ethical contract as a practitioner on some level. So I, I don't know how you would, um, I don't know if it's a, something you can respond to now, but um, someone has a question for me. <laughs> uh, did I understand right that you mentioned extractivism as institutional practice? If so, would you like to elaborate a bit on your thoughts. So in my framing statement, what I, I think what I uh, pointed to were the dangers of methodologies that um, uh, extract that um, exactly uh, what may occur in an instance when we enter um, context and um, we, uh, you know, weaponize our, our our privilege and power in particular ways when working with people and communities um, and with archives in particular, I think the, the um, dangers of um, extractivism occur in um, when we look at the, 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 the challenges of working with a colonial archive and how we um, and how redress comes about without again, Reperpetuating trauma um, and erasure. Yeah, so that's what I meant. <laughs> cool. Can I, say, can I say something? Sure, Gloria. Yes, I'm. I'm very much agree with you, and I think it's very important to point that. I mean, all my African friends, or well, not all of them, but they always remind me that African uh, Africa history doesn't start with colonization. Right? So maybe if we insist of talking always about colonization, maybe it's a way of like uh, cleaning our eyes or cleaning our, uh, I don't know, uh, washing our responsibility or I don't know why we keep on doing this and till that point of maybe even re reinforcing the idea of, a, of, a, of a, a continent that lives because of us, 
you know, it's like the, what I told, said before of talking about the other to 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 uh, um, make your identity even stronger, to talk about what what you are not. So maybe that we should stop uh, talk, uh, taking these archives as a tool of, but for me, it's, it, it's, I mean, it gives me so much information that I can't, I mean, you, you were saying previously, why do I put these two images that maybe for you is, it's annoying or it's irritating, but it's maybe through irritation is the way that, as Julia said, is the way that people, you know, go like that and react. I don't know. I wouldn't like to irritate you. I would like <laughs> to irritate the other, the other guys. But you know, it's all kinds of, you have all kinds of audiences looking at your book, right, yeah. Maria? And I think, um, yeah, yeah, and maybe, I don't think I'm irritated. I think I'm, I'm wanting to know what the intention is of even um, uh, pursuing these archives or retrieving them. Julia, you wanted to make a point? No, I just wanted to say that they mm. might irritate, but some people might felt hurt by them as well. That's what mm. I thought. Um, mm. And this is what I was curious about if you ever showed them to um, um, the, the local community, uh, the, the book, um, did they ever have, you know, had a look at them or the, 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 the women on the picture? Did they have a look at the, at the result at the book, Gloria? Not, not the book, but the photos. I, I mm -hmm. showed in 2017 and the book mm -hmm. is, was just released in September mm -hmm. this year. Oh, okay. I, so, um, I mean, I did, I did send one to Azu, Lagos photo director and African. Yeah, I, I know him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also maybe he will show it to people around. And mm -hmm. yes, maybe if I go back. Because uh, I would be curious to know what they would think of mm -hmm. this um, them, mm -hmm. you know, next to next to the historical um, pictures. You know that. Curious. I mean, talking the the all the photos that I did to to women. All my friends that I did there, and even the model, they didn't like them. I mean, they don't like. I mean, they they. I mean, this particular woman didn't like my ways of portraying them. Be not the studio photos that I show in my project. I mean, face, normal face, she posing and all that. They don't find herself beautiful, mm -hmm. and for me, they looked amazing. So, I mean, these photos, the problem is that they can be uh, misunderstood, but that's, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that I can't uh, help it. I mean, mm. it's over there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there are several questions maybe I should have gotten to about the process um, of your practice in developing this kind of work and this, this, pro this book project. Um, you know, questions around collaboration. Uh, at what level is the uh, is there collaboration between you and and you know, be they your friends or but the people in the images that you photographed in the way that you photographed and is the work in dialogue with like the long history of African studio photography, um, very rich history. You know that um, I think sort of elevated uh, um, people in very specific ways. Um, so, but Gloria, thank you. I think your project is challenging in that sense. There are many ways in which we could explore what's happening in your work. Thank you all. I think we are wrapping up. Uh, I, I had hoped for more questions, but I think there was definitely some good back and forth and some, some great um, entry points into the different projects that we, we looked at today. Thank you. Mona? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for contributing and joining this event. I mean, the audience, but also the panelists. I'm really happy that uh, we could work on this together for the last past month. So, yeah, thank you so much. And I think it's also a good opportunity to also think further about how could strategies uh, for decolonization be 
applied and how can we use some of the projects you already started and like who are working on these issues for years now so yeah thank you thank you thank you so much for the invitation <laughs> thank you thank everyone you. thank you thank you bye bye good night good, good night yes <laughs> good night see you soon